Todd got front page attention with a clever publicity stunt. Electrical music spouting from a manhole during rush hour in the intersection of Broadway and 25th Street. While musicians were practicing at Telharmonic Hall, large crowds gathered to throw coins in the manhole and the police had to shoo people away. The company later claimed that Telharmonic electricians at quitting time had accidentally left a receiver attached to the Broadway cable. Long into the night, heavenly electrical music flowed out of the street. The notes are clear and clear. Absolute faithfulness. By this time, the Telharmonium had lost its novelty. To expand the audience, programs became increasingly light and frothy, featuring marches and show tunes. In a desperate move to stimulate interest, Telharmonic Hall had become the host of a low-grade musical freak show. Melodies were sent from new keyboards into lily pads and doorknobs. A soundboard was put under a man's coat to represent the musical human body. Another stunt involved wiring people directly. Noses tingled and fingers vibrated as several thousand volts ran through their systems. The press called it the liver gavotte. Ironically, as classical music disappeared from Telharmonic Hall, Todd managed to wangle testimonials from stars at the Metropolitan Opera. Next, he touted a literary endorsement. And finally, one from Johanna Gotsky, a German soprano, whose career would later flounder after her husband, a German naval officer, tried to blow up the Welland Canal in Canada during World War I. Unfortunately, business did not pick up and capital could no longer be squeezed out of investors. The expenses of operating the central station, paying for the franchise, and wiring the city had been staggering. With less than two miles of wires having been placed in the streets, there was virtually no income. Telharmonic Hall gave its last concert in February 1908. Frederick C. Todd closed the doors and disappeared. In May, an unpaid advertising bill was turned over for collection to the sheriff. A deputy visited Telharmonic Hall in June to find it deserted. From the Plaza Hotel, which had opened a few months earlier, came another lawsuit. The builders had wired every room for Telharmonic service. Now, the New York Electric Music Company was unable to fulfill its contract. It seemed that the newest branch on the Tree of Science had become gnarled and twisted and would be left to wither away. Thaddeus Cahill refused to accept defeat. He was still hard at work in Holyoke and was valiantly starting to build the third Telharmonium. Cahill resolved to get a franchise from New York City to operate the Telharmonium himself. He completed the new instrument two years later in April of 1910. Like the second machine, it weighed 200 tons. This time, music was produced on standard keyboards and there was just intonation in a few keys. By 1911, Cahill gained control of the corporation set up by Crosby and Todd. For $175, New Jersey's governor, Woodrow Wilson, approved the reinstatement of the New York Electric Music Company, formerly a New Jersey corporation. After much delay, Cahill finally negotiated a franchise with New York City. New Yorkers would soon have their beloved electrical music back. Cahill and his brothers immediately transported the third Telharmonium. The new central station was housed in a shabby little building on West 56th Street. The Cahills ran a cable to Columbus Circle and Carnegie Hall and then down Broadway. In February 1912, the final debut of a Telharmonium took place in the chapter room of Carnegie Hall, a small concert room on the fifth floor. Neither the press nor the public was especially interested in the revival of a six-year-old failure. There are still many improvements to be made in the tone and carrying power of the telharmonium. The absence of brilliancy 
Mordency and sizedness makes the telharmonium but a sorry substitute for an orchestra, even a small one. Rather crude. The the operation now is rapid as normal. Later that year, Thaddeus Cahill convinced the city to reduce the franchise fee. But no one was willing to invest money in the enterprise, and this time there would be no subscribers. The orchestral sound of his third telharmonium still left much to be desired, and everyone was eagerly anticipating commercial radio. Only several temporary and trial telharmonium outlets were installed. One was in the Pabst Grand Circle Hotel on Columbus Circle. Another was at the magnificent Hotel Astor near Times Square. For the Astor program, which featured 16 numbers, the Cahill brothers changed the name of the instrument to the Electrophone, but to no avail. As a matter of fact, only the usual organ tones are perceptible to the musically informed. Just before Christmas, 1914, with a debt of $145,000, the Cahill Brothers Corporation finally declared bankruptcy. The family fortunes improved several years later when Brother George invented the Cahill glareless duplex arc floodlight projector, which made night sporting events possible for the first time. Thaddeus Cahill died of a heart attack in 1934. Two years later, a clockmaker named Lawrence Hammond introduced a miniaturized telharmonium he called the Hammond organ. His patented rotating tone wheels were extremely similar to Thaddeus Cahill's patented rotating dynamos. However, by then, three of the Cahill brothers and sisters had died, and the elderly survivors were too old to undertake a patent lawsuit. Although the second and third telharmoniums had been scrapped when taken out of service, Brother Arthur devotedly preserved the first one in New Jersey for almost 50 years. He circulated a letter in 1951. The five great and immortal patents of my late brother, Dr. Thaddeus Cahill, reveal everything that has been done or that can ever be done in electrical music. There was no interest. In 1959, he wrote David Sarnoff, the head of RCA, and offered to help build and install a new telharmonium as an improvement over the RCA synthesizer. RCA politely declined. Upon Arthur's death in 1962, the last remaining telharmonium was sold for scrap. Yet Thaddeus Cahill's revolutionary idea of electrical music did prevail. Over the years, many inventors took up the challenge. By 1985, more electronic keyboard instruments were being sold than any other musical instrument. One company, Kurzweil Music Systems, happened to give a fundraising presentation at the Maryland Club, just where the telharmonium was first demonstrated in 1900. Unfortunately, Kurzweil followed the steps of the New York Electric Music Company into bankruptcy. Nevertheless, most film and TV soundtracks today use electronically generated music. Thaddeus Cahill's extraordinary vision laid the foundation stones, changing forever the music we listen to. Absolutely perfect music. <laughs> 